This is Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles as read by Significant Brothers. The original story can be found on fanfiction.net by username Proud Housewife. This is a supplement to episode 23, Fan Fiction by the Significant Brothers podcast. Enjoy. Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles Submitted by user Proud Housewife on fanfiction.net This is satire. Author's note Hello friends, my name is Grace Ann, but recently I've encountered a problem that I believe this is the solution to. My little ones have been asking to read the Harry Potter books, and of course I'm happy for them to be reading, but I don't want them turning into witches. So I thought, why not make some slight changes so these books are family friendly? And then I thought, why not share this with all the other mommies who are facing the same problem? So, ta-da, here it is. I'm so excited to share this with you all. So, without further ado, Chapter 1 Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Harry Potter who lived under the stairs in a house on Privet Drive with his aunt and uncle. He was a good, obedient boy who did all of his chores, but he felt that there was something missing in his life, something big and special, but he could not quite name it. He stayed up every night and wished for this special something, but then one day, there was a knock at his door, and everything changed. Answer the door, Harry, his Aunt Petunia, a career woman, barked from her armchair where she sat with her feet up. She had short, curly blonde hair and never wore any makeup. Uncle Vernon nodded sheepishly from the kitchen and put a tray of moist chocolatey brownies in the oven. Shouldn't you be doing that, Harry thought? But he was a very obedient young boy, so he answered the door right away. He turned the brass metal doorknob and pulled open the heavy wooden door. On the porch was standing a huge, muscular man with a big, manly beard, and he was dressed in a plaid red shirt, blue jeans, and sturdy leather boots. His chest was covered in a thick, unruly carpet of coarse brown hair. He wore a necklace that looked to Harry like a lowercase t. Just looking at him, Harry felt happy, peaceful somehow, but he couldn't say why. Good morning, kiddo, the man greeted amiably and smiled at Harry. He had the peaceful, friendly sort of face you just knew you could trust. My name is Hagrid. Could I speak with your mommy and daddy? I don't have a mommy or daddy, Harry replied sadly, and looked at his raggedy old shoes that were blue. Perhaps that's why he felt so lonely, he thought, not for the first time. Maybe that was what was missing. A mommy and daddy. But no, that was not quite right. I am so sorry to hear that, Hagrid uttered empathetically. You can speak with my auntie and uncle, Harry retorted politely, and blinked his big, blue, childlike eyes. What do you want? Aunt Petunia peered out the door with her narrow, suspicious eyes, and she was wearing a baggy, unflattering pantsuit. Hello, neighbor. I was wondering if you had been saved, Hagrid exclaimed brightly, and tipped his wide-brimmed straw cowboy hat. Aunt Petunia laughed a gravely laugh and leaned forward in her sturdy, practical boots. Saved? Don't tell me you're one of those Christians. Harry didn't know what that word meant, but Hagrid's smile was the most peaceful smile he had ever seen. It made Harry feel warm and happy inside just seeing the glowing, radiant grin on the kind, friendly stranger's face. He wondered why Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon did not smile like that. Yes, I am, Hagrid replied kindly. Are you? Aunt Petunia laughed again and stuck her pointy, sharp nose in the air. We're too smart for that. Haven't you read Dawkins? God is dead. Dawkins proved that. Would you like us to educate you on the Dawkins? What's a Christian? Harry queried innocently and scuffed his shoe on the shaggy yellow carpet which hadn't been vacuumed in quite some time. Christians are people who want to be good, Hagrid explained wisely and crouched down so he was on eye level with Harry. We want to go to heaven after we die. Do you know what heaven is, Harry? Harry shook his head and his big eyes were wide and curious. Heaven is a beautiful place where we can go and be with God. Aunt Petunia smacked her hands over Harry's young ears, and her voice was sickly sweet when she said, Thank you very much for your concern, sir, but he doesn't need your religion. He has science and socialism and birthdays. Haven't you heard of evolution? I have a very good textbook on evolution that I could give to you if you want to learn things. Hagrid laughed wisely. Evolution is a fairy tale. You don't really believe that, do you? Yes, I do, Aunt Petunia screeched. Well then, prove it. Aunt Petunia could only stare at him. 
Her big mouth hung open dumbly. Here she thought she was so educated and always demanded that Christians prove what they believed in, but she couldn't even prove her own religion. It was then that Harry knew who the smart one here was. Tell me how to get to this heaven place, Harry cried wistfully, clasping his hands together. Sometimes the wisdom of little ones is really amazing. We think we grown-ups know it all. But then God speaks through the mouths of little ones and shows us how we are all mortal, struggling along the path of life. Humility. All you have to do is be saved. Do you want to be saved? I do, I do, Harry squealed, jumping up and down. Then pray the sinner's prayer. Aunt Petunia tried to stop him, but she was powerless against Harry's pure, innocent, holy energy. Soon, Harry had said the prayer. Hagrid beamed happily. You're a Christian now, Harry, Hagrid cried proudly. Harry smiled, but then interrogated. But how do I be a Christian? I don't know how. Hagrid grinned widely. There's only one place to learn that. Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. Author's note. So, what do you all think? I may not be a professional writer, but I think I'm being given the talent to pull this off in the service of a greater mission. Blessings, Grace Anne. Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles, Chapter 2, New Horizons. Author's note. Hello, friends. I've been getting so many lovely, thankful messages from mommies everywhere, and I just want to say thank you all for your encouragement. However, I've also been getting several messages saying that my story is bad because Harry Potter is not just about witches. It's also about friendship and kindness and bravery. Friends, this is exactly what I have been saying. Harry Potter has so many good things about it, but it still is witchcraft, so my children can't read it. But that's why I'm writing this, so they can have all the adventures and good morals of the Harry Potter books without all the bad stuff that is bogging it down. I mean, Matthew 3.12, am I right? So, without further ado, on to chapter two. Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles? Harry queried and clasped his hands together. Just at hearing the name, he felt such a sense of inner peace. He wanted to have more of that peace, and he wanted to learn how to be a good Christian. He was starting to think that peace and being a good Christian were in fact the exact same thing. I wanna go there. Hagrid beamed widely. He had been praying so hard to save a soul today. And he was so happy to have saved the soul of such a sweet, earnest little one. The poor boy, being raised by two parents who were not Christian, and who both went to work and left him with a babysitter all day long. It was a good thing that Hagrid got here in time. Five years down the road, Harry might have been a fornicating, drug-addicted evolutionist. Don't be silly, Harry, Aunt Petunia commanded and wrung her long, bony hands. Come back inside. I will read you about evolution from the Dawkins. You don't need that silly religion. Harry scrunched up his innocent little face and thought very hard. Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon were as close to parents as he had. And this was the only home he knew. Could he really leave? But he was saved now. He had prayed the sinner's prayer. He could not stay here. Not anymore. Not with what he knew now. Suddenly, he knew what he had to do. No, Aunt Petunia. He uttered calmly and with childlike wisdom. Evolution is not real, and I am going to Hogwarts. No, no, Harry, Aunt Petunia screeched desperately. I have an idea. You can have a second birthday today. You like birthdays, right? Birthdays are not of God, Harry verbalized knowingly, and looked at his aunt with an innocent wisdom. You tried to corrupt me, but it didn't work. But I forgive you, Aunt Petunia because of Luke 23, 34. Hagrid was amazed once again at the wisdom of little ones. He didn't know if he could forgive someone who had hurt him as much as this woman had hurt little Harry. Deny him the truth? Who could be so cruel? But Harry didn't even think twice about it. He forgave, just like that. Truly, Hagrid gained a new understanding of Matthew 19, 14 that day. Do not leave, Harry, Dudley wailed childishly. I must, Harry said and stepped over the threshold. Goodbye, Dursleys. I hope you're saved too one day. And with that, he and Hagrid began to walk down Privet Drive. How will we get to the school, Hagrid? Harry queried curiously. We will pray, Hagrid retorted knowledgeably. How do we do that? Harry solicited inquisitively. Watch, Hagrid said, and then got down on his knees on the road. He motioned for Harry to get down on his knees too. Hagrid raised his hands to the heavens and cried out in a deep, 
thunderous voice. Dear Lord, take us to Hogwarts. Harry felt himself being whisked away, and in a moment he was sitting in the cool, damp grass outside a humongous, beautiful castle. He looked in awe at the tall towers and gray stones. What a beautiful place! A tall, thin man with a long, pointed beard and big wire spectacles stood in front of Harry. He was wearing a brown tweed suit and a nice matching hat. His shoes were made of leather and polished until they shone. He had a smile much like Hagrid's smile. So peaceful, Harry just knew he could trust him. A lovely, kindly young woman with flowing blonde hair and a pleasant heart-shaped face stood beside this holy man. Hello there, little one, the man greeted amicably. I'm the Reverend Albus Dumbledore, and this is my wife Minerva. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. Author's Note Blessings Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles, Chapter 3 Author's Note Hello, friends. I've struggled a lot about whether or not to keep going with this story, but with a lot of praying, my husband and I have decided it is the right thing to do. We want our little ones to have good Christian literature to read. And in this modern world, sometimes, that can be hard to come by. So, I will just have to make do. Pleased to meet you, Reverend Dumbledore, Harry replied enthusiastically and got to his feet. This sure is a beautiful place you have here. The Reverend beamed. Why, thank you, little one. His voice had a distinctive southern twang to it that made Harry feel so safe and welcome. He knew that in that moment that the Reverend was a man of God. This little one was being raised in a terrible situation. Hagrid declared concernedly. He was watched by a babysitter every second of the day. His aunt saw him as part of the perfect life package, like the big house, the fancy career, the speedy car. Dumbledore shook his head sadly. Too bad no one told her. Parenting should be about the children, not the parents. That's why it's called parenting. Hagrid nodded wisely. Dumbledore turned to Harry and announced authoritatively, Now, you can start your classes tomorrow morning. Today, you can get settled into your dormitory. But first, why don't you eat dinner with my family and me? Really? Harry gasped excitedly. I've never had family dinner before. Why don't you come with us then? Dumbledore cried kindly, and then got down on his knees. Everyone else did the same. Raising his large, massive, manly hands to the heavens, Dumbledore bellowed in a voice even louder than Hagrid's had been. Lord, please take us to the kitchen. Suddenly, they all found themselves in a tasteful, decorated kitchen. Wow, Harry shouted in awe. He was still getting used to the power of prayer. Sometimes, we take the wonderful things the Lord gives us for granted, and it takes a newcomer to the fold for us to understand just how blessed we are. That was amazing. Hagrid smiled knowingly. God is an amazing guy. He sure is, the reverend's wife chuckled before getting down on her knees and raising her hands upwards. Dear Lord, please set the table with the sky blue cloth and the Sunday dishes, and please give us biscuits, fried golden brown, and gravy, creamy mashed potatoes, my great aunt Eleanor's corn casserole, corn on the cob slathered with butter, and for dessert, some chocolate raspberry cookies. All of these things appeared on the table exactly as the reverend's wife had asked for them. Masterfully prepared and delicious smelling, Harry's mouth dropped open. Truly, this woman was a real Proverbs 31 wife. Hermione, the reverend summoned loudly, dinner time! Immediately, and with a cheerful obedience, an 11-year-old girl in a pretty pink dress with a matching bow came running down the stairs. She ran over to her father and gave him the winning smile that daughters have. Welcome home, daddy, she smiled, and turned to his wife. Can I help it all with dinner, mommy? It's all prepared, thanks be to God, her mother retorted gracefully. Hermione nodded knowingly. Hermione, I'd like you to meet Harry Potter, our newest student at Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles, Dumbledore introduced magnanimously. Harry, I'd like you to meet Hermione Granger, my beloved daughter. Pleased to meet you, Hermione responded sweetly with a shy grin. Harry could barely respond. This was the most beautiful young woman he had ever come across. So different from all the girls in public school, who were focused on trying to be like the career women they saw in Sex in the City. This little one was the picture of innocence and godliness. Now, Dumbledore pronounced genially, Let's eat. As the holy men, women, and little ones dug into the delicious manna the Lord had granted them, the conversation amongst the adults turned to darker topics. Harry listened intently, and he did not understand it. But he was very interested. Dark days are coming, Hagrid pronounced gravely around a mouthful of casserole. Evil forces are coming to this world, and the little ones at Hogwarts may be our last resort. 
Psalm 127, 5, Dumbledore referenced solemnly, and the others around the table nodded knowingly. Hogwarts might be the last hope for the forces of good in this world. Author's note. Blessings! Chapter 4, Dangerous Days Ahead Hello friends, I apologize for being gone so long. One of my little ones came down with pneumonia, so of course, my life has been nothing but doctor's appointments and chicken soup. And that's not on top of all the other work that a mommy has to do. I had nearly forgotten about this little story of mine when I sat down to catch up on my email. And lo and behold, there were dozens of messages from this lovely site. Now of course, there were some hateful messages that made me very sad. But for every review posted by an evolutionist with a B in his bonnet, there were three lovely private messages from other mommies out there thanking me for doing the Lord's work. Wow, I know when the Lord is telling me something. So here's another chapter for all you mommies out there. And all you non-believers spreading hatred, well, let's see if you aren't converted by the time this story's over. When the delicious filling dinner had ended, Harry wiped some last tasty cookie crumbs from the side of his mouth. He was very full and very tired. Discovering the truth, being saved, and coming to Hogwarts, it had certainly been a long day for this little one. You look like you could use a good night's sleep, the reverend's wife commented daintily. How would you like to move into your dormitory? I would love to, Harry cried cheerfully. He was so excited to become a student here. He was so grateful for the opportunities the Lord had given him. Sometimes people who have done without are the most grateful. Hermione, why don't you show our newest student to the dormitory, Dumbledore suggested wisely. I'd love to, Daddy. Hermione replied obediently with an innocent, girlish smile, and got to her feet and smoothed out the skirt of her becoming pink frock. Should I clean up the kitchen first? I can take care of that tonight, the reverend's wife answered indulgently, and she was already beginning to clear the elegant porcelain dishes. Thank you, Mommy, Hermione shouted gratefully, and she walked over to Harry. Would you please come with me? Harry blushed shyly and got to his feet. His aunt had never taught him how to talk to pretty girls. She always said that pretty girls were shallow, and not very smart, and that a real woman put her career first and didn't care about her looks. But it only took one look at this godly young girl to realize just how wrong that was. A woman taking pride in her appearance is honoring the Lord. Because, after all, it is the Lord who gave her a pretty face and nice hair. Taking care of that is important. Harry got the feeling that Hermione was as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. The two little ones stepped out into the brisk, chilly night, and for a few minutes, they were both silent. Harry didn't think it was possible for this sweet, demure girl to be as nervous as she was. But, going by the silence, perhaps she was a little nervous herself. After a few minutes, Hermione welcomed shyly, Welcome to Hogwarts. It is a wonderful place, and we really are so glad to have you here. Harry's face reddened as they crossed an expansive, flowery field. They were going in the direction of a cluster of imposing, stone, academic-looking buildings. Thank you, he muttered happily. It is a beautiful place, and it feels very holy. It is, Hermione commented enthusiastically, and her chocolate-colored, carefully curled tresses were bouncing along with her steps. My father is a very godly man, and to spread the word with the Lord is his greatest dream. Truly, that is a noble dream, Harry responded gravely, with wisdom beyond his years. They walked for a few more minutes in silence. Eventually, they reached the end of a lovely green meadow. The boys' dormitory is this way, Hermione exposited knowingly. And with the innocent, casual affection so often found in children, she grabbed Harry's hand as she led him around the edifice of classrooms. Harry was so nervous, he could not think of anything to say. His brain fumbled for the perfect Christian thing to say, but before he could even manage a word, Hermione came to a stop in front of a tall stone tower. This is the boys' dormitory, the devout young woman kindly explained, and she gestured to the heavy oak door beside them. I would show you inside, but I'd hate to cause a scandal. I understand, Harry declared graciously. Too many young men these days pressure young women into things undesired and forbidden. It's the mark of a true old-fashioned gentleman to respect the fact that every young woman is another man's future wife. And we all know that it would be a dreadful, terrible sin to bring another man's wife into intimacy. Why does modern culture suddenly treat that as okay simply because he doesn't have her yet? Man's law may permit it, but the laws of the Lord are not bound by time. Hermione moved to push open the imposing large door, but she struggled with the knob. It was quite a heavy door. But Harry was a good, devout Christian now. He would not have a young, godly girl struggling to open a door which he was perfectly capable of opening himself. 
With the simple faith so often seen in little ones, Harry got down on his knees and lifted his hands skyward and shouted prayerfully, Dear Lord, please open these doors and allow me to enter my new home. With a loud, thunderous boom that echoed throughout the expansive, beautiful campus, the doors crashed open. Harry stood up piously as Hermione's jaw dropped. Now she knew for certain that this was truly a man of the Lord. Harry was about to step inside when Hermione grabbed his arm. He blushed once more. Wait, Harry, Hermione uttered quickly. There's something you should know. What is it? Harry queried questioningly. My father says the dark times are coming, Hermione spoke worriedly. There's a man named Voldemort who wants to destroy all that we stand for. He's pushing an agenda in Congress which will stop us from practicing our faith freely. But that's what our founding fathers built this nation for, Harry cried indignantly. The freedom of religion! Voldemort doesn't care, Hermione remarked sadly. And she shook her head. And he is gaining power. The freedom of Christians to practice our faith is disappearing by the day. Soon, it will be like it was in Rome. Lovely, ladylike tears began to roll down her delicate, terrified face. And I don't like lions. It will be all right, Harry reassured manfully. We will just need to pray really, really hard. That's why we're here, after all. You're so brave, Hermione pronounced admiringly, and she wiped the tears from her eyes. She flung her arms around Harry's neck. Thank you for giving me courage. Harry patted her head before departing and entering his new home. It wasn't until the doors had closed behind him that he realized that he did not know where he was supposed to sleep. The tower consisted of an old stone staircase winding up the steep, sacred walls, and there were doors leading into each bedroom off of the stairway corridor. Harry felt very lost at the moment, but a quick prayer showed him the way. As he collapsed into his bed, very tired from such an eventful day, he thought about the days that were coming. It was truly a good thing that the Lord had called him when he did. Chapter 5 A New Friend? Author's Note Hello friends! I'm very sorry if this chapter is a bit shorter than usual, because just as soon as one sick little one gets better, wouldn't you know it, another one starts running a fever. Whew! A mommy's life sure is exhausting. I wasn't planning on posting another chapter until things had settled down, but the hubby says the work of the Lord doesn't wait for the whims of men. So you can all thank Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 for the speedy update. Oh, and on that note, some of you lovely readers have requested me to write down the Bible verses after each chapter. Well, far be it from me to not spread the word of the Lord. Another question I have gotten. In the original books, Harry Potter and his friends frequently question authority. How do I feel about this? Well, this is quite a toughie, you ask me. I talked to the hubby about it, and we agreed that usually it is good to obey authority. But when authority is acting contrary to the Lord, you should talk to the authority about it. Acts 5.29 You just might see authority figures making bad decisions in this chapter. Nobody is perfect except the Lord. No, not even Dumbledore. No matter what the original books told you and how Harry Potter handles this hint. It will be very different than the original books. And finally, I got a PM from a lovely friend who was a bit confused, so I'll just clear this up now. I do not own the original books, and those belong to JKR. So, without further ado, Harry Potter woke up drowsily in a comfy, fluffy mattress. It was only now that he had energy to observe his surroundings. The room was small, but also everything a little boy needed. There was a big warm fireplace in the gray stone wall across from him, a shelf of intelligent, age-appropriate books. The Holy Bible was in the center of the shelf, of course, and there was a simple wood dresser of respectable, school-appropriate attire, and of course, a clean porcelain sink for washing and brushing teeth and such. It was only then that our hero noticed that there was another bed in the room. It was the same as his own bed, except that this other bed had not been made. Also, this bed had its own Bible in it, and it looked different from the one on the shelf. But where was this new roommate of his? Harry looked behind him to see a small, pallid young boy with shockingly bright red hair kneeling with seeming piety as he prayed to a small statue. At this shocking sight, 
Harry felt a horror, but he quickly composed himself and declared bravely, Hello friend, my name is Harry Potter, and I take it that we are roommates. What's your name? Ronald Weasley, the other boy responded friendly, and he reached out a hand to shake. Welcome to Hogwarts. I am a Christian too. Really? Harry exclaimed delightedly and clasped his hands together. This is joyous news. Ronald smiled deviously, and Harry remembered that he had just seen this boy praying to a statue, and he wondered why that would be, but he was new to this whole Christianity thing, and maybe that was okay. Still, it didn't feel quite right. He bravely resolved to bring it up with Dumbledore. Would you like to come with me to breakfast? Ronald queried politely as he got up from the statue he had been kneeling in front of. They have delicious food here in the Great Hall. Would I ever? Harry cried delightedly, and he bolted out of bed and brushed his teeth and washed his face. This little one certainly had a healthy appetite. In a jiffy, Harry and his new friend had joined the stream of young lads on the steep, winding stairs heading to breakfast. They could smell the aroma of breakfast from the Great Hall, and it wafted right into their noses. Before they knew it, they were all sitting in the Great Hall. Come sit with me and my family, Ronald offered eagerly, and he motioned frantically toward a table packed full of people with hair just as red as his. Come on, come on, come on! I can't wait for them to see that I have made a new friend. Harry followed Ronald with the obedience of one who does not have many friends in a new situation. Oh, what a difficult circumstance that that can be. And how many believers have been led astray by those situations? Guys, guys, guys! Ronald screeched joyously as he pulled Harry toward the table of his family. This is Harry Potter, and he is my new roommate. Hello, Harry, the Weasleys chorused in unison. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. H hello Harry stammered shyly. Something about this group made him nervous. Nice to meet you. He sat down at their table. He could smell a delicious breakfast. But where was the food? No sooner had the thought crossed his mind when the Reverend Dumbledore came onto the Great Hall stage and dropped down to his knees and raised his hands skyward and screamed, Dear Lord, please provide these devout young ones with three strips of bacon or links of sausage each. Two for the ladies, a bowl of hearty oatmeal flavored with cinnamon and apple chunks. Two poached eggs cooked all the way through, home fries seasoned with garlic, a glass each of orange juice and milk, and dishes up to the task. Harry was once again amazed to see food appear in front of him. The food looked and smelled amazing. He suspected good old Minerva had something to do with this delicious spread. But before he dug into the food, he remembered that he had something to discuss with the Reverend. Harry fought his nervousness and ran after Dumbledore as he hopped dexterously off the stage. Excuse me, the young believer cried innocently as he ran after the Reverend as his little legs could carry him. Excuse me, Reverend. What is it, son? The Reverend reiterated kindly. He was dressed respectably in sturdy, manly jeans and a red, white, and blue plaid shirt over which a few virile stresses were visible and a pair of admiral brown cowboy boots. I sure am, Harry retorted graciously. How are things with your family? Very well, replied Dumbledore knowledgeably, and he was impressed with this little one's manners. Was there something you wanted to talk to me about? Well, Harry began uncomfortably, and he scuffed his blue sneakered foot against the polished wood floor of the Great Hall. I woke up this morning, and I saw my roommate praying to a statue. Is that really an okay thing to do? That is a real toughie, Dumbledore answered ponderously. Well, I don't worship idols. It is, in fact, a very unchristian thing to do. But you see, here at Hogwarts, we divide ourselves up into sorting hats. After breakfast, all the new little ones will choose their hats. Each of the different hats have different beliefs. But we all love the Lord, and what more in common do you need? That does sound true, Harry pondered sensitively. But is it really? It seems that if we really love the Lord, we don't need to divide ourselves. Are the divisions between the different hats really so significant as to merit dividing Christianity? What are these divisions? Well, they're somewhat significant, Dumbledore allowed tentatively. For instance, 
I'm a Gryffindor hat. We believe everything in the Bible, and only the Bible. That red-headed roommate of yours is a Slytherin hat. And Slytherins worship statues? Harry queried innocently. The Reverend nodded gravely. Then how are they Christians? Harry questioned skeptically. What about Exodus 20, 4 through 6? That's a Ten Commandment. Well, they have different commandments, Dumbledore explained well-meaningly. They love the Lord, and that is all we need. But do they really love the Lord? Harry posited timidly. If they do, then why do they worship statues? Dark days are coming, Dumbledore replied earnestly. We need to be inclusive. If there were only Gryffindor hats at Hogwarts, then there would not be many people left. I see, Harry conceded uncertainly as he walked back to Ronald's overcrowded table. He was getting nervous about this hat business, but he supposed he did have to trust Dumbledore. After all, grown-ups know best, right? Author's note. Blessings. Author's note. Hello, friends. I apologize to people whose private messages I haven't been able to reply to, but things are awful busy here in Fort Parsons, and a mommy's work is never done. Many thanks to those lovely friends who have asked about the little ones. It looks like the second sickie did not have pneumonia after all. It was just the flu. It was a rough few days, but now all the little Parsonses are in tip-top shape. Phew! Harry Potter walked back to the table of redheads. It was only now that he noticed that they were all wearing black and green baseball caps with snakes on them. Tentatively, Harry sat down next to Ronald, who was not wearing a hat, since he, like Harry, was new. So, Harry began nervously, and he bit into a thick, juicy slice of perfectly fried bacon. What sorting hat do you think you will choose? Oh, I'll definitely choose Slytherin, Ronald declared confidently, and he began to eat his oatmeal with his hands. My whole family is Slytherins. He gestured to the countless redheads sitting at the table, and they all turned to Harry and smiled and waved. You should become a Slytherin too. We could do it together. Hmm... Harry uttered ponderously, and he took a bite of his eggs. Why don't you tell me what the Slytherins believe? Sure, Ronald replied ecstatically, and he kept eating his oatmeal. Well, first of all, we believe in the Bible. That's wonderful, Harry reacted happily, and he took a sip of his orange juice. I do as well. Perhaps I could be a Slytherin after all. But wait, that's not all, Ronald continued excitedly, and he washed his oatmeal down with milk. Gryffindor hats believe in the Bible too, but Slytherins have even more. We have a book full of guidelines on how to be a good person, and a whole panel of Slytherin hats to tell us what to do. Harry furrowed his innocent, childish brow, and he took another bite of oatmeal, and he questioned confusedly, Why do you need all that if you have the Bible? Ronald guffawed, and he shoveled more oatmeal into his mouth, and he replied, Why only have the Bible when you can have more? Why, that'd be like only praying to God. Harry gasped in horror as he bit into more bacon. Of course I only pray to God. Who else would I pray to? What about Mary? Ronald posited angrily around a mouth of oatmeal. You have to at least worship her. You mean the mommy of our Lord? Harry demanded in scandal, and he chewed his bacon. I don't worship her. Well, then God hates you, Ron stated simply, and pieces of bacon flew out of his mouth as he did so. Harry was tentative, since he was new to this whole Christianity thing, but he did not think God would hate him for not worshipping his mommy. On the contrary, he had a hunch that God wanted people only to worship him. Don't listen to him, commented a drowsy voice, self-righteously behind Harry. Harry turned around and he saw a girl about his own age. Her pale yellow hair was tied into braids, and she wore a tie-dye shirt and faded jeans and flowers in her hair. Peace signs and donkey patches were sewn all over her clothes. You should not become a Slytherin hat, the girl continued confidently, and she was eating what looked like it was supposed to be bacon, but it didn't smell like bacon or taste like bacon. It missed that smoky, meaty taste that bacon is supposed to have. Instead, it tasted like vegetables blended together and dyed red. Yuck! Harry would take real bacon over that any day of the week. They are far too strict. Harry hummed skeptically. He was not sure about this whole Slytherin business, but the word strict was not what came to mind. You should become a Hufflepuff hat, the girl instructed arrogantly, and continued to nibble at her breakfast. That's what I'm going to do. What do Hufflepuff hats believe in? Harry pondered aloud, and he took a bite of his real bacon. Oh, how he wanted to find the true hat. 
Hufflepuff hats believe in the Bible, but only some of it, Luna explained casually, and she was still feeding on that stuff. We don't believe in the stuff against fornication and drinking and socialism, but we really like Matthew 7, 1, and that's about it. We're really fun, and we seem really nice and really tolerant as long as you agree with us. That was when a derisive laugh echoed through the cafeteria. A smug-looking young woman about Harry's age, with slick back hair even paler blonde than Luna's and wearing a sweater vest and khaki strolled languidly down between the rows of tables. Please ignore this fool, Draco drawled smugly. Luna here thinks she can have a career even though she's a woman, and women are stupid. Harry gaped at this horrible person. What a mean thing to say. Women shouldn't not have careers because women are stupid, Harry shouted indignantly. Women are not stupid at all. Women should not have careers because women are nurturing and loving and their gifts serve them best in the home. Draco gasped tentatively. You are diluting the truth. Women are beneath men. No, I'm not, Harry fired back bravely. You are twisting the truth so you can be mean with it. Women are not beneath men. Men and women are just different. Luna smiled at him gratefully. Draco was clearly fumbling for ground here. There was not much ground to stand on when you were being hateful. But he finally came up with, Well, at least I don't eat with Slytherin hats. I hate Slytherins. Ronald began to cry into his oatmeal. I don't hate Slytherin hats, Harry declared boldly. I think they should become Gryffindor hats, but that is because I love them. Besides, the Lord ate with sinners all the time. Thank you, Harry, Ronald whispered tearfully. Well, well, you should just become a Ravenclaw hat like me, Draco sputtered blusteringly. We are really the best hat. I think you mean we really are the most hateful hat, Harry corrected cleverly, and then he jumped up onto the table and he got down on his knees and he raised his hands to the ceiling of the great hall, and he bellowed, Dear Lord, I have made my decision. I am a Gryffindor hat. Author's Note Blessings Chapter 7 Wheat and Chaff Author's Note Hello, friends. Phew. This chapter took longer to write than I thought it would. There's so much to be done here at Fort Parsons some days. I don't think I'll ever get caught up. But now that the little ones are sound asleep, I'm finally getting around to putting the finishing touches on this little chapter. I apologize for the delay. Now, there have been quite a few questions and comments coming in, and I thought I should take time to address a few, since I don't have time to reply individually. First of all, to all the mommies who've expressed their appreciation of this little story of mine, thank you. Your support keeps me writing. Remember though, the glory is not mine. It is the work of a greater cause. And the people who call me names, a Bible-believing Christian, is like a big, ugly monster who lives under a bridge. And wanting everyone to do the right thing and go to heaven makes me a so-called bigot, hmm? Well, that's this modern world for you. And finally, to the people who say that I am spreading hate, take a look at some of the comments posted here, saying that I'm a terrible writer and a terrible mother whose children will hate her one day. Who is it who's spreading hate here? Because I don't think it's me. The Great Hall burst into applause as a red and yellow baseball cap with a lion embroidered on the front appeared on Harry's head. He hopped deftly off the table and landed on his little feet. He was even more sure of his decision when Hermione dashed across the cafeteria to give him a big, spontaneous hug. She too was sporting a red and yellow baseball cap although her cap had a kitten on it instead of a lion. I'm so happy, Harry, she cried gladly, delicate tears streaming down her face. When I saw you eating with that family, I was so scared. I thought you might become a Slytherin. Never worry about that, Harry declared boldly and bravely. I am a Gryffindor, now and forever. Well chosen, Dumbledore declared approvingly, as he took long, energetic strides to cross the crowded, noisy room. Welcome to the Gryffindor hat, Harry. Harry beamed happily. Truly, he had been blessed. As he sat down to finish his breakfast, he was still glowing with joy. He sat back next to Ronald. Will you still be my friend, even though you are a different hat? Ronald asked timidly. Of course, Harry declared generously and he began to eat his eggs. 
He had expected his eggs to be cold by now, what with all the hullabaloo, but lo and behold, they were still piping hot. He would not pretend that what Ronald believed about worshipping the dead, but he could still offer the young boy friendship in the spirit of Matthew 2, 16-17. Thank you, Harry, Ronald uttered happily. He may have been sporting a green and black hat with a snake on it, which testified to his Slytherin beliefs, but he could recognize Harry's pure-hearted godliness, generosity, humility, and innocent goodness. He looked around at his siblings, all of them wearing hats identical to his, and he wondered why none of them were like that. Attention, students, Reverend Dumbledore announced authoritatively as he hopped onto the stage and he held the microphone by his mouth. Congratulations on picking your hats, he continued kindly. I am sure you have all chosen wisely. Harry hummed to himself. He knew that the reverend meant well, but was it really doing the members of the other hats much good to tell them that everything was the same when it wasn't? Wouldn't they all be happier if they knew to read the Bible and take it seriously? Dumbledore thought he was making everyone happy, and perhaps he was in the short run, but in the long run, Harry worried that he was doing more harm than good. Harry did not say anything, because he was new to the flock and didn't feel confident in his connection with the Lord. But sometimes, it takes newcomers to point out the flaws we don't see in our own communities. The Reverend clapped his hands against each other once. And then he spoke enthusiastically. Now, you will be sharing most of your classes with other members of your hat, so it would be good for you to get to know them now. Ravenclaw hats, please gather around Mr. Moody. Hufflepuff hats, please gather around Mr. Sprout. Slytherin hats, please gather around Mr. Finnegan. And Gryffindor hats, please gather around Mr. Snape. Now, at the beginning of the breakfast meal, Harry had noticed a tall, mysterious-looking man with long, dark hair and gaunt, enigmatic features. He was dressed stylishly in a crisp black suit, and his tie made a shock of red and otherwise totally black outfit. The dark hair on his pale chest was neatly trimmed, but still noticeably thick, and he wore elegant black leather shoes on both of his feet. It was now that he noticed that, on the table that this man was sitting at, was a place card that said on it, Mr. Snape. Harry followed the other brave young children, wearing Gryffindor hats. Author's note. Blessings. Chapter 8. Refreshing Honesty? Author's note. Hello, friends. Things have finally calmed down a bit here in Fort Parsons. And I'm so excited to share with all of you another new chapter. One thing I would like to talk about though, many people have been calling me a misogynist. That means woman hater. Friends, I do not hate women. I am a woman. Now, what is it I have done to have people calling me this? Well, apparently it is saying that women are loving and nurturing and good. Right, how hateful. I'm just a big old mean bigot, huh? Wait. Wrong. That is not a bigoted thing to say at all. Now, it is certainly true that what is written in the Bible about women was used as an excuse to actually be hateful to women. And that is terrible. And there are some people out there who think all women are stupid or less than men. Friends, this is not what I believe at all. I believe that women have special gifts that are no less than men. In fact, I think that if womanly virtues were respected more, the world would be a much better place to live. Any of those so-called Christians who hate women and think women are stupid and worth less than men and that God doesn't respect us, well, they will get a very serious talking to from a certain housewife. Now, does that sound misogynistic to you? Harry Potter walked nervously over to the table of Mr. Snape. The other little ones wearing red and yellow hats did the same. Mr. Snape silently stood up, and he motioned with his head 
for the boys and girls to follow him, and he sauntered out of the great hall. He led them into a small classroom with a few desks in it. He silently motioned for the little ones to sit down at the desks. They did. He stood up at the blackboard in front of them. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles, greeted the older, but still handsome, in a dignified, rugged way amicably. The little ones all sat in respectful attention. So you have all chosen the Gryffindor hat, Mr. Snape queried, and he raised his eyebrow. Yes, Mr. Snape, chorused all the students together. Well, Mr. Snape said, and he drew his tall, strapping form to its full, impressive height. I would like to say that your choosing will make you happy, or that your lives will be easy. But I will not lie, there are dark forces in the world, and they do not like Christians. And when I say Christians, I mean Gryffindor hats. They love the Hufflepuff hats because the Hufflepuff hats believe everything these people say and slap the label Christian onto that philosophy, and so the Hufflepuff hats make it easier. The Ravenclaw hats these people claim not to like, but then they pretend that the Ravenclaw hats extremism applies to all Christians, so the Ravenclaw hats help them. Harry frowned confusedly. After the Reverend's acceptance of all the hats, he wondered why Mr. Snape was addressing things so directly. He found Mr. Snape's honesty refreshing, but he also wondered was the honesty also combined with the hate for others that he had seen in Draco's hat? He thought the other hats were wrong, but he didn't want Mr. Snape to hate them for being wrong. He wanted to help them. And then, of course, is the Slytherin hats. The Slytherin hats will tell you that we're all on the same side because they agree with Gryffindor hats on some things. But do not be fooled. Their leader is working with Voldemort. A shocked, horrified gasp echoed throughout the classroom. Harry slapped his hands over his mouth in an attempt to contain his horror, but he was still shocked. His new friend only worshipped a goddess, but he was also now in cahoots with Voldemort. The little ones all gasped again. This time they were even more horrified. From the back of the room, a clean-cut, respectably dressed young boy raised his hand. But what about the Constitution? Dean Thomas questioned articulately. Doesn't he care about the First Amendment? Mr. Snape shook his head sadly. I'm afraid not. And Voldemort is working through him and using them all. Before long, all our freedoms will be gone. Dean Thomas raised his hand again and queried coherently. But why does Voldemort hate Christians so much? No one knows, Mr. Snape responded tentatively. However, he is on the move, and he is gaining power, and we Gryffindor hats may be the only ones capable of stopping him. Harry was nervous, but he clenched his fist determinedly. He was scared, but he was ready to face this evil. Author's Note Blessings Chapter 9 A Letter at Dinner Author's Note Hello friends, I apologize for how long it took to get this chapter out, but I have good news. Starting tonight, I will be taking a beginning writer's course at the local community college. Through all the hate from evolutionists, feminists, and Romanists, there has been some legitimate criticism of my writing skills. My mother did her best, and she certainly did teach me a lot, but grammar was not her area of expertise. It's taken some convincing, the hubby wasn't sure I'd have time to get everything done if I start taking this class, but I've written up a schedule, and I think we can make it work. One week into the school year, Harry was slowly, gradually starting to get used to everyday routines at Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. There was breakfast in the Great Hall every morning, and then there was a prayer session led by the Reverend. The Slytherins went off to have their own quote-unquote, prayer sessions in their own way, and the Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws prayed with the Gryffindors. But the Hufflepuffs complained about the Reverend quoting the Bible, and the Ravenclaws complained that the Reverend didn't seem to really hate sinners, he just hated sin. 
After the prayer session, the little ones all went to their classes. There were regular math and English classes. Of course, although they were a higher caliber than one would find in a public school, and then there were Bible studies and Christian history. After that was lunch in the Great Hall. After lunch were more classes about American history and constitutional law and the missionary training. After these classes was dinner in the Great Hall, after which the students had free time. It was just such a dinner that Harry was eating now. He was sitting with his new friends, Hermione, Ronald, and Dean Thomas. This food certainly is delicious, Harry observed gratefully, and he was savoring a bite of perfectly roasted chicken. It really is, Dean Thomas concurred intelligently. He was dressed quite respectable today, and he was wearing a button-up shirt and clean blue jeans, and his hair was neatly combed. Hermione nodded in agreement, and the yellow bow she had tied her hair back with bounced up and down. Ronald grinned widely, but remained silent as he shoved another handful of deep-fried Brussels sprouts into his little mouth. Ronald ate breakfast and lunch with his family, but he was eating more and more dinners with these Gryffindor friends of his. It never ceased to amaze him just how nice they were, even though he wore a different hat. A little unconditional friendship can really go a long way in a person's heart. It was then that a bunch of beautiful people with wings, wearing glowing white robes, swooped in through the Great Hall's huge windows. Yellow halos covered over their heads, and they wore brown leather satchels around their shoulders. They gracefully reached into their satchels and gloriously flung envelopes down to the students below. The male's here! Dean Thomas observed accurately, and he shielded his eyes with his hands as he gazed up in wonder. Harry propped his chin up on his hand, and dreamily watched these magnificent postmen distribute their wares. He did so love to look at angels. He was surprised when a letter fluttered down to him, and it landed lightly on the table in front of him. He'd never gotten a letter before. He smiled innocently at the angel, who had delivered it, and the angel waved back. Would you look at that, Dean Thomas uttered fluently. You got a letter, Harry. With excited hands, Harry broke the seal and took out the parchment that was inside the envelope. He laid it on the table and saw the familiar, slanting, tidy handwriting. Dear Harry, how are you enjoying your first week at Hogwarts? I hope you're enjoying it a lot. How about you come over for tea this evening after dinner, and you can tell me all about it. Harry smiled as he folded the letter and put it back on the envelope. Good old Hagrid. What does it say, Harry? Hermione questioned shyly, and she played with one of her smooth, lovely curls. Hagrid wants me to come over for tea, Harry reported excitedly. Would you all like to join me? I'd love to, Hermione replied sweetly. That sounds like fun, Dean Thomas responded eloquently. Could I come? Ronald asked tentatively after he had swallowed his Brussels sprouts. Harry, Hermione, and Dean Thomas exchanged a knowing look, and then Harry answered kindly, Of course you can. Ronald smiled gratefully before going back to his Brussels sprouts. When dinner finished, Harry got to his feet, and then he declared boldly, Let's go. Author's note. Blessings. Chapter 10. Dangerous Days Are Here. Author's note. Hello, friends. Sorry this chapter took so long to post, but the instructor of my new writing class was kind enough to proofread it. I didn't take all of his suggestions, but I liked most of them, and I hope the wait was worth it. Oh, another thing. A few good-intentioned but misguided readers have expressed quote-unquote concern about my asking husband's permission to take a class. Friends, it is not long ago that I would have thought the same thing. Culture told me that wifely submission was demeaning, and I believed it. All I will say is this. Read Created to be His Helpmeet by Debbie Pearl. Life and Marriage Changer. Hagrid lived in a lovely little house on the edge of Hogwarts campus. The little ones arrived right on time, and the delicious smell of tea and cookies was wafting outside. Smiling in anticipation, they knocked on the door. Hagrid opened the door and beamed down at them. Welcome, Harry. I'm so glad you could come. And you brought friends. 
Indeed I did, Harry said and gestured at the upstanding young fellow at his left. This is Dean Thomas, a Gryffindor hat. Pleased to meet you, Dean Thomas said intelligently. Hagrid smiled at the little one, impressed. This is Hermione, another Gryffindor hat, Harry said, motioning toward the little girl to his right. Hermione smiled shyly and waved. Charmed, Hagrid waved back. And this is Ronald, Harry said. Ronald looked up sheepishly from where he stood behind the trio. He could sense that Hagrid was truly a man of the Lord, in a way that no one in his family, or perhaps the entire Slytherin hat, was. To be in the presence of such piety was humbling for a little one such as this. Hagrid noticed the green and black hat, but didn't comment. Instead, with true mercy and compassion, he opened the door wide to all of them. Glad to meet all of you. Please come in. The four little ones filed in. The inside of Hagrid's house was tastefully decorated. The curtains were plaid, the walls were wood, and the bare rug covered the floor in front of the fireplace. Mounted above the mantelpiece, in a place of pride for all to see, was a moose head. The oaken table in the center of the kitchen was set for five, and the kettle on the stove was just starting to sing. This is a nice place you have, Harry commented. It really is, Dean Thomas said intelligently. Hagrid grinned with pride. Thank you. I live by John 1519, of course, but I do try to keep it tidy. Harry, Dean Thomas, and Hermione nodded knowingly. In a few minutes, they were all seated at the table while Hagrid passed out his famous chocolate chip cookies. They munched on the delicious morsels as Hagrid poured the tea. How's school going? Hagrid asked. Quite well. Harry replied. Just then, the timer buzzed. More cookies! The little ones cried in delight as Hagrid got up to get them. While Hagrid was getting cookies, Harry's eyes fell on a newspaper Hagrid had left open. The headline on the front page read, Voldemort spotted at Hogwarts? Would you look at that? Dean Thomas murmured observantly, picking up the paper and scanning it. As he read, he whispered the article's terrible words. Voldemort was spotted by several students yesterday at Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. This is the man who is trying to put a bill through Congress to stop Christians from practicing their beliefs. If passed, homeschooling will be illegal. Christians will be put in jail, maybe even killed, unless they say the Bible says what Voldemort wants it to say. Saying, Merry Christmas, or hanging up the Ten Commandments will put you in a re-education program. When Dean Thomas finished, Hermione burst into tears. Harry gave her hair an innocent, friendly pat. How could anyone be so angry at God? Hermione sobbed. I don't know, Harry declared tentatively. He's a horrible person. Dean Thomas nodded sagely and muttered to himself in disgust. First they try to change the Pledge of Allegiance, now they don't want us to be Christians. Next they'll be killing all of us. It's a bad time to be a true Christian in America. Ronald sat in guiltily as he watched his new friends fearing for the future. He was beginning to wonder just what sort of hat it was that he had chosen. Chapter 11. A Challenge. Author's Note. Hello friends. The writing class is going quite well and I stayed after this time to talk to the teacher about my little story, which he has been so kind about helping me with. He has had lots of very helpful suggestions, and I truly think that I have been guided to this class by a purpose greater than my own. Another thing that I've gotten many messages about, the Slytherins. People are saying that somehow this means I hate Catholics. Friends, I do not hate Catholics at all. All I want is for Catholics and everybody else to go to heaven and be happy with God. Do you want to know who truly hates Catholics? The so-called Catholic Church. Ironic, huh? But think about it. Why else would they lie to Catholics about salvation? And did you know their leader is a socialist? It seems like a certain someone doesn't know much about the Bible or the Constitution. And what about there only being one God and no others? So, if any Catholics are reading this, I'm asking you this in love. Consider which is more important, your so-called religion 
or truth. Harry, Hermione, Dean Thomas, and Ronald all walked solemnly back to the main campus. They could hardly believe what they had just read. Voldemort on their campus? What would they do if they ran into him? They quickly went to their dorms and got to sleep. The next morning, the four little ones sat together for breakfast. The spread was truly delicious. Fluffy scrambled eggs, crispy bacon, home fries, grits, waffles, apples, orange juice, and iced tea. Truly, the blessings today were abundant. I still can't believe Voldemort has been seen on our own campus, Harry whispered after swallowing a bite of bacon. Neither can I, Dean Thomas commented perceptively. I'm scared, Hermione murmured and fidgeted with her fork. What if he tries to kill Harry? It will be fine, Harry declared boldly, and then gave her hand a reassured squeeze, and then they both blushed. What are the four of you gossiping about? A voice said. It was smug and it came from behind them. Harry turned around and he saw Draco standing behind him. Draco's hands were folded and rested on his stomach. Behind him stood two other young men, dressed the same as Draco. Tan pants, brown sweater vests, and white button-up shirts. We were just discussing something we read in the newspaper, Harry said friendly. Would you like to join us? Draco chortled pompously. I think not. You may be comfortable dining with women outside your family, but I'm not. I know that I am better than women. Why would I want to talk to one? Harry gritted his teeth. He had had enough of this. So-called feminist these days, calling everything sexist. A man respecting his woman and providing for her and giving her the children and home that she truly desires is called woman-hating. Such silliness can make us forget what real sexism looks like. The truth is, women are just as smart as men, and God made us as their equals. But equal does not mean the same. When we treat men and women as being the same and tell women to go work all day and forget about her true calling as a wife and mother, then that is the real woman-hating. And then there are people like Draco, who think that God messed up and made women worse than men. And neither is okay. That's a mean thing to say, Harry screamed bravely, and he banged his fist on the table so hard that the plates bounced. Mr. Snape looked over in their direction, and he saw the commotion that was going on at the moment. He was dressed very dapperly today in a freshly pressed dress shirt and practical pants that complemented his long, muscular legs perfectly. Above the top button of his shirt, a hint of the thick carpet underneath was visible. He carried with him a big, heavy King James version of the Bible as he sauntered across the cafeteria. What exactly is going on here? He questioned, folding his arms over his chest. Nothing, Draco muttered in the embarrassed voice of one who knows he has done wrong. But Harry boldly and honestly retorted, Draco was being a bully to the ladies. With a gasp, Greg covered his mouth with his delicate, long-fingered hands. Detention, Draco. We as Christians must be respectful of women and treat them with the gentleness they deserve as our mothers and sisters and daughters. Mr. Snape grabbed Draco's wrist and led him out of the cafeteria. Harry smiled holily at the sanctimonious fool. Draco shook his fist. I'll get you for this, Potter. Tonight, after dinner, in the courtyard, we will have a pray-off. Chapter 12 Author's Note Hello, friends. I have this chapter all ready to go a week after the class last Saturday, but then of course things got in the way, like they always seem to. But now that things have slightly settled down here at Fort Parsons, I thought I would finally post this. The campus was dark when Harry, Hermione, Dean Thomas, and Ronald walked out of their dormitories. It was completely silent because all the other little ones were asleep. The bright shining stars twinkled approvingly at the righteous young Christian trio. I'm nervous, Ron uttered shakily. Isn't this against the rules? Harry, Dean Thomas, and Hermione exchanged a knowing look. It wasn't Ronald's fault. It was just how he had been raised. Slytherin hats do not usually question authority. They think that they just need to do what the head Slytherin hat tells them to do. They never think that maybe the Lord's work is more important. This is the Lord's work, Harry explained patiently. This is more important. That's right, Dean Thomas said wisely. 
Not a single word was mispronounced. He had dressed quite respectably for the occasion. His face was scrubbed quite cleanly. Any mommy would be proud to have him for her son. Oh, Ronald murmured wonderingly. He had never thought that anything could be more important than following the rules. Not even the Lord's work. Ronald was starting to ask the big questions. Questions which just might lead him to salvation. Just think what would happen if Harry had not known to love the sin and not the sinner. Just then, Draco stepped out from behind a tree. He was wearing yet another sweater vest, and he was proudly sporting a Ravenclaw hat. Well, well, Potter, Draco drawled smugly. Looks like you came to the prey off after all. That's right, Harry answered courageously. Well then, Draco grinned self-righteously. Let's pray. Harry and Draco got down on their knees and raised their hands to the sky. I'll go first because God loves me best, Draco declared confidently. With that, he shouted, Dear Lord, if you agree with me that women are stupid and Potter is wrong, please strike him down where he kneels. Dean Thomas and Ronald gasped. Hermione began to cry. But Harry did not flinch. He knew that he was a man of the Lord. Draco grinned viciously as he looked to the sky for a bolt of lightning, but none came. His eyes widened and his jaw dropped. He began to cry. Now it was Harry's turn to pray. He raised his hands far higher than Draco's had been, and he screamed in a voice far louder than Draco's had been, Dear Lord, if you agree with me that women are just as good as men, but just different, please, for a second, he thought about asking for Draco to be struck down. But then he was overcome with mercy. Please make him a Gryffindor hat. In that moment, the hat on Draco's head changed into a red and yellow one with a lion on it. And the tears rolling down his face were not sad tears. They were happy tears. The crowd of onlookers burst into applause. But Harry didn't notice all the cheering students and teachers. He was bathing in the love of the Lord. Author's note. Hello, friends. Many of you have notified me about the typo in the last chapter. Oops. I was feeling so confident in my newfound writing skills last class, and I didn't think I needed to ask the teacher to proofread. Once again, oops. I guess this just goes to show that Proverbs 16.18 applies to us all. And that, friends, is why this chapter is so late going up. I waited to post until Greg had had a chance to look over it in detail. He says I'm definitely improving, but he did still have some suggestions. Hope you all enjoy. Chapter 13 A Visitor to Hogwarts The cheering crowd converged on the two righteous boys. They were led by Dean Thomas, Hermione, and Ronald. Hermione reached Harry first. Joyful tears were streaming down her face, and her lacy pink skirt was swirling around her legs. When she reached Harry, she wrapped her delicate arms around him in a chaste hug. I was so scared, she whispered tearfully. Harry pulled away and patted her reassuringly. He told her, there's nothing to be afraid of. Not when you are on the side of righteousness. Hermione grinned admiringly. She exclaimed, you're so brave. Harry smiled humbly and brushed and rubbed the back of his neck like a shy schoolboy. He didn't know why, but he felt so different around her than other people. Perhaps it was because she was so godly but Harry felt that it might be more than admiration that he felt. What was the word? He could not quite put his finger on it. Dean Thomas stepped forward and gave a very polite handshake. Amazing job out there, he commented intelligently. Harry smiled humbly. It was the work of a power greater than my own. Dean Thomas shook his head in admiration at how humble Harry was being. Truly, a light was shining in this little one. Ronald was next in line. Tears were streaming down his face, and his nose was running down to his chin. He wiped his face with a big freckled hand. He stuck out the other one for Harry to shake. Harry generously returned the action. That was amazing, Ronald sobbed honestly. How do I be as holy as you? Harry, Dean Thomas, and Hermione exchanged a knowing look. Maybe, they suggested. It has something to do with the hat on your head. Ronald got a thoughtful look on his face. His many siblings that were too many for two parents to care for 
did not like the look of that. Altogether, they walked over and grabbed Ronald and pulled him away. Harry, Dean Thomas, and Hermione were sad. But they hoped in their hearts that their words of truth would plant a seed and grow. But before they could think too much about that, a car pulled into the parking lot. It didn't look like a car a busy mommy or daddy would have. No, this was a small, so-called eco-friendly car. Harry, Dean Thomas, and Hermione looked at it suspiciously. They didn't know who would come out of it, but they got the feeling it would not be someone good. The car stopped. The door opened. A man stepped out. He was tall and pale-skinned. He was a younger man, with only a thin layer of hair hidden underneath his shirt. He was wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants and sneakers. No one seemed to take much notice of him, but then the reverend's wife stepped onto the scene. She screamed. She fainted. At the sound of her cry for help, the Reverend Dumbledore came running to the rescue. So many so-called pro-women's rights people think that Ephesians 5, 22 through 25 is just about wives being submissive. What they don't talk about is that it also tells husbands to sacrifice for their wives. Wow, does that sound oppressive? When he saw the man who had gotten out of his car, he stopped and gasped, and then he shouted, Stand back, students. This is Voldemort himself. Chapter 14, Bravely Defeating the Foe. Author's note, Hello friends, I have some news, and I know that it might be disappointing to the mommies out there. My husband and I had a very long talk last night, and he doesn't think that posting my writing online and going to classes is a good idea for our family. It was a hard decision for me to accept, but he does know the best. I want to thank all of the many righteous believers who have supported me in this little mission of mine. And I hope that this little chapter ties up the loose ends as best as one chapter can. Harry gasped, and Dean Thomas gasped too, and Hermione burst into tears. As Voldemort ambled through the parking lot, the enormous crowd of righteous students were nervous. But they still stood boldly in the face of such horrifying evil. Dumbledore stood in front of them protectively and manfully. Harry looked at the depraved man walking toward them and he thought of all the lies that he must have been told by evolutionist and feminist all his life. And he thought of the empty, meaningless depravedness that he would have to distract him from the missing love in his life. And he thought of how one day he would die, and that there would be no happy heaven for him, only the flames of hell. Harry wondered how anyone could be so stupid. Who would want hell more than heaven? It made Harry so angry. Voldemort stopped walking when he was in front of the Reverend Dumbledore. He arrogantly nodded and said, Hey, my name's Tom Riddle. I'm here to visit my cousin. Which way is the guy's dorm? Enough of your lies, Dumbledore exclaimed bravely. We know who you are. Voldemort blinked stupidly, and then he uttered childishly, I'm sorry, what? Dumbledore smiled smartly. You're pretending to be dumb, I see. Well, I'm not stupid. We all know how much you hate Christians. What? I don't hate Christians, Voldemort lied dishonestly. What are you even talking about? You're still pretending to be dumb, the Reverend pointed out truthfully. We know all about your plot to illegalize Christianity, Voldemort. Voldemort blinked stupidly again and questioned evilly. Wait, this is about my Reddit account? Is that what you call your godless coven? Dumbledore queried knowingly. Well, yes, I've indeed seen your so-called Reddit account. And just try to deny your hatred of Christianity when you post things like, Christians all sucks. Their religion is stupid and should be illegal. I will write to Congress and tell them to make law. Harry Potter laughed intelligently, because Voldemort did not even understand proper spelling and grammar. That was a joke, Voldemort retorted unintelligently. That whole account is a joke. I mean, Voldemort the righteous skeptic? He laughed with the nervousness of one who knows he is damned. Of course you're not supposed to take it seriously. Do you think religion is a laughing matter, young man? Dumbledore demanded righteously. Well, it's not, 
what sort of joke is trying to outlaw religion? Of course I don't actually want to outlaw religion, Voldemort uttered deceptively. That would be ridiculous. I just got annoyed by the ridiculous straw man some Christians have made out of atheism. So whenever I saw someone ranting about how depraved and evil we non-believers are, I replied with something like that. You know, taking that stereotype to an extreme to point out how ridiculous it is. Also, a small but vocal minority of atheists exist that stereotypes and mocks anyone who disagrees with them. They can be just as hateful as people think we all are, and that does real damage. They bug me as much as the straw man arguments do, and they give those arguments credibility. So I do the same thing to them, replying with an extreme version of what they said to highlight the absurdity of it. So you're making fun of atheism? Dumbledore interrogated shrewdly. No, no, I am an atheist, Voldemort explained sinfully. I'm just, just as I thought, Dumbledore surmised wisely, and he smiled holily in satisfaction that the Lord had worked through him. We've been preparing for this day, and we've been preparing for it for a long time. Students, the holy little one stood at attention. Convert him, Dumbledore commanded bravely. And all at once, the students began to shout. You have been tricked by the lies of society, Harry shrieked knowingly. You deserve to burn in hell. Come over here, Dean Thomas screeched articulately. Debate me on religion. I'm just so upset that you don't accept the Bible, Hermione sobbed femininely. The Bible is the best book ever. Why can't you just respect that? I'm a Gryffindor hat now, Draco yelled boldly, with the inspiring zeal that so many newcomers to faith have. Do you hate me now? I bet you do. Voldemort covered his ears with the discomfort that heathens often find themselves with when they are confronted with the truth, and he shouted loudly to drown out the word of the Lord. You've been preparing to do this? To scream at me? It is the work of the Lord, Dumbledore explained accurately. Aren't there better ways to spend your time than preaching to a bored idiot who makes fun of people on the internet? Voldemort questioned hedonistically. Your Lord seemed pretty concerned about helping the people around him. Is that not his work anymore? How can we focus on helping people when there are people like you trying to destroy us? Dumbledore countered astutely. I told you before, that Reddit account is a joke, Voldemort whined pathetically, but the Reverend shook his head. I thought that might be so at first, the Reverend commented fairly, but it was just too realistic. How is it realistic? Voldemort inquired uniformedly. It wasn't even subtle. I waxed poetic about the sexiness of neckbeards and said that Christopher Hitchens has superpowers. It was supposed to be funny. How could you take it seriously? Dumbledore scoffed, and he replied faithfully, Like it or not, your little joke is what most atheists today are like. So, my Reddit account solidified your conception of atheists as a bunch of anti-Christian bigots who are just angry at God? Voldemort solicited stupidly. And then he sighed. Okay, you know what? This has gone too far. I'm sure that most people can tell that I'm not being serious, but if I'm contributing to misinformation and stereotypes, I don't feel comfortable continuing this. Voldemort pulled an iPhone out of his pocket, and he began to type on it. After a few minutes, he showed the screen to Dumbledore. See this? I just made a post. I am a troll. It is the last post I will make on the account. Are you happy? Dumbledore virtuously ignored the heretic, and he turned to the little ones standing behind his protection. Students of Hogwarts, this fool will not listen to reason. Let's save this heathen soul. All the little ones got down on their knees, and they raised their hands to the sky, and they screamed to the heavens, in the voice of those who knew they were doing a great work. Lord, please make Voldemort a Gryffindor hat. Voldemort sighed wickedly, and then he shook his head godlessly, and then he walked away depravedly. But even as the fornicating, drug-addicted evolutionist disappeared into the distance, the righteous little ones continued to pray. They knew that if they screamed loud enough, they could change the world. This is the end of Hogwarts School of Prayer and Miracles. Brought to you by Significant Brothers and fanfiction.net's user Proud Housewife. This story was satirical.